Good morning, yogis. Dory and I are once more back in the studio to share with you a yoga video that will support the flexibility and strength of shoulders, upper back, as well as the calves and the plantar's fascia at the bottom of your feet. So today's props, I want to talk just a little bit about the props because I don't want you to be scared away from what you see. You can see a bolster, but you know how to make a bolster by rolling up a blanket or a sleeping bag or a blanket and a sleeping bag and making the shape of a bolster. We've shown that in way back at the beginning of our videos, maybe 15 or 16 videos ago, a bolster or something like a bolster. I'm going to show uh, stretching the planter's fascia at the bottom of the feet using a wooden brick because that's what I have. But hardcover book or some facsimile, you want something firm that you can stand on safely, hence the brick. The belt, you know what to do about belts. If you have one, that's great. If you don't, make one, knot a couple of scarves together or garment belts and link them together. I'm also showing four foam chip blocks. Now, I don't really do retail and I don't like to advertise because everybody has their choice. But here in Nanaimo on Bowen Road, there is a business called Bedroom and Furniture and foam is what they do. And they sell four of these for $30. And if you look by comparison on yoga prop uh, uh, on-site catalogs, you'll see it's an extraordinarily good deal. So I suggest you think about investing in four foam blocks when the day comes that those shops and businesses open. If you don't have foam blocks, you can substitute blankets, two or three blankets. That will do the trick. In addition to that is a blanket and a chair. So we're going to begin now with this wooden brick and it's coming at the base of the wall. The wooden brick is set down parallel to the wall and about mm, a generous hand span out from the wall. When you step onto the brick, you're going to step with the toe mounds and the toes. And just a reminder about toe mounds. They're the fleshy pads at the base of the toes. And you can see the big toe mound is a very large fleshy pad. It has an important job to do to help us balance our, our, our body weight on the feet. So stepping onto the bricks, take the fingers to the wall for support and then see that the toe mounds come on the brick or whatever you're using as a facsimile and step up. Spread from the big toe mound right the way across the little toe mound and take the inner heels a little bit away from each other. Here, the action is keeping the fingertips at the wall, at, at the sides of the chest, elbows snuggled in, lengthen from the back of the knee right the way down to the heel towards the floor. See if you can keep the heels moving a little bit out and away. Lift up again, toe mounds broad, balancing weight, big toe mounds a little, stretch the heels down. You can see that the heels are not initially reaching the floor because the calves are stiff. So I wait and let the heels stretch down from the calf, from the back of the knee, right the way down, up again and down. Let's say eight or ten times, you'll feel a powerful stretch coming through the back of the leg through the Achilles tendons, into the heels, and down to the floor. At last, when I let the heels set down on the floor, I know that the calves have stretched out. Now I'm taking a second action. See how the fingertips reach up the wall at about the shoulder width distance. I'm flexing the finger knuckles and thumb knuckles and then stretching the heels down toward the floor, the top of the shoulder joint reaches down the back 
and wide away from the sides of the neck. Up we go, elbows are bent, and walking fingertips up the wall. Finger knuckles, thumb knuckles are flexed. Heels are stretching down. This has the effect of stretching the entire trunk down toward the floor from the anchors of the fingertips. If this pose downward facing dog isn't available to you because of shoulder issues or some other issue, you can do this pose and get the length of the back body, side body, and front body that down dog gives. And then take fingertips down so you have control and step down. And here we are, off the brick, and coming on to all fours. Some of you would benefit from a kneeling pad because of knee issues. So I'll show with the kneeling pad, just folding a blanket or some soft surface so that when your knees come on the pad and your calves and feet come straight back, you're now working with the hands and the wrists. Here, the index fingers are parallel to each other. And I'm rolling from little finger mound right the way across to thumb mound to broaden the hand. As we, as we <clears throat> look at the wrists, we think of the wrists as balanced evenly across, like that, parallel to the edge of the mat. Even though the shape of the wrist joint isn't quite uh, like that, we parallel the wrists like that. And then we go to the elbows. Now, some of us have very flexible elbows, so we can push the outer elbow tip into the joint and hyperextend the elbow. For those of us with hypermobile elbows, we have to guard against that. So we bend the elbow very slightly, bend it very slightly, and lift up from inner elbow deep up into the shoulder joint. We stretch the inner arm up. And as we press thumb mound, index finger mound, long finger, ring finger, little finger mound down, there's a resonance in the shoulder joints. Coming with the fingers straight forward is the classical position of the hands in downward dog. But the hands can also turn away from each other like this. And again, <clears throat> we have to guard against pushing the elbow joints in and forward. The inner elbow joints face each other and we're lifting up from inner wrist deep up into the inner shoulder joint to straighten the arm bones. There's yet another position. We could take the hands to face each other. Here I'm taking my wrists even with the edge of the mat and firming the elbows. Each one of these positions turns the arm bones in the shoulder joint. This is an interior turn of the humerus or upper arm bone in the joint. The final position that I'll show today has the fingers pointing straight back towards us. And here we bend the elbows a little and stretch up from inner wrist to inner elbow to shoulder joint. Each one of these positions helps us to free up the connection of the arm bone in the shoulder joint. Lift the hand and take it forward, lift the hand and take it forward, and once more, place the hands as if for downward facing dog. And then join the fingers, squeeze the wrist down toward the floor, keep the chest lifting, but take the shoulder blades down the back and press them forward to open the chest. And then pull the hands apart and feel the fingers, palms, wrists, forearms, elbows, upper arms, shoulder joints. Notice any tingling, warmth, spreading sensations. That's releasing in those areas. To continue, we're going to take our side body to the wall in a standing posture. You'll need to look from the back 
to see what's going on with that. So blanket goes away. I'm taking one of the foam chip blocks, but again, a reminder to you, if you don't have a foam chip block, not to worry, don't worry about that. Just use your palm at the wall. I'm turning my back to you now with my side body coming to the wall and my right arm extended upward like this. Here, the hip is just lightly touching the wall. The shoulder joint is almost touching the wall. I'm standing with legs together. Top of the bike is reaching down to the heels. Shoulders are resting downward. From this position, I'm mindful to broaden the back of the shoulder joint toward the wall. So I breathe into the right side of the ribcage and expand to the right. Once I feel the shoulder touching the wall and the ribcage touching toward the wall, I lift both heels and slide the foam block further up the wall. Then I bend the knee that's close to the wall and the outer heel is stretched down from deep in the left side of the abdomen. I don't move the hand at the wall, not even a little. As I release that left heel, downward and downward and downward from the center of gravity on the deep abdominal wall. The heels come down, so the second heel comes down. I take the foam block in hand, and now we see the pose from the front. Here, the left arm is reaching up. We're breathing into the left side of the trunk. The left hip, the left shoulder are coming toward the wall. The palm is pressing the foam block. And now, both heels lift, and the hand slides further up the wall. I plant the hand. I bend the knee that's close to the wall, but this heel, further from the wall, from deep inside the abdomen, there's a reach down through the inner leg, and the whole body is stretching down from the lifted hand. Down and down and down and down goes that right heel until it reaches the floor, and then both heels come down, the foam block comes down. That's a way of using traction at the wall by planting one part of the body so the other, the rest of the body, can reach away from it. We're setting the foam block aside. Now, from here, we're going to be on our abdomen and you might want a little bit of softness under the belly. I'm facing away from the wall and smoothing out my blanket so that when I come onto the front body, my feet can touch the wall. I have coiled the toes away from the wall. The heels are on the wall. That's how I know I'm the right distance from the wall. Then I just let the legs relax for the moment. I let the toes turn in for the moment. And I'm reaching the arms away from me and noticing how there's a gap there's a window between the armpit and the floor. So I bend the elbows, turn the palms to face each other, and walk the elbows forward. I'm deliberately using the cork floor to walk the elbows forward so that they can slide. I look down toward the floor. I'm going to take my specs off and just bring the palms together and inch the elbows forward. As I inch the elbows forward, I'm working to close the gap between the armpit and the floor. In order to do that, I have to spread the shoulder blades wide away from the spine. I have to spread the collarbones and then slide the elbows further forward. Each time I slide the elbows forward, the little gap between the armpit and the floor becomes a little less of a gap. And then, having done the best I can for this moment, I take the hands down and turn on to the side, draw the knees up so I'm coming out of this position in a safe way. 
way to the back. Press the hand down, look down, and come up. This area between the inner arm and the sides of the armpit, Mr. Iyengar said this area holds storehouses of energy. And we know that the lungs extend into this area of the rib cage. So lengthening this area is beneficial because it gives more space for the breath in that area. There are other physical benefits as well that we can take into further postures. I'm now backing myself up a little and again coming on to the abdomen with a soft blanket at the, at the belly and backing myself up to the wall in such a way that the heels are at the wall. I've lengthened the side body as best I can, lengthened the armpit region as best I can, and now I'm simply exploring, can I raise the arm with the palm facing toward the floor? And how high can I raise that arm? And then, can I stretch the arm forward from the sides of the ribcage? And then rest that hand. Second side, arm comes up, maybe a little higher, and then it lengthens from the side body forward, and rest. Having done that, I'm warming up the upper body, the arms and the armpit region, and now I work for the legs. I'm looking down so the back of the neck is long and I raise first one leg and then the other. And I do it again. And again. And this time I bring a little more mm, discrimination. I'm turning that front thigh in towards the center of the mat and lifting the inner thigh higher than the outer thigh. Like that. Working in this way, yogis, you can hold those postures for a couple of breaths each time. You can make your entire yoga practice raising the legs, raising the arms, and give yourself the opportunity to repeat it many times and see how the body begins to unleash into that shape and build stamina and strength. Coming up now, we turn on to the side, draw the knees up, press the top hand down, look down and come up. It's a safe way to come out of a reclining position for the back. I take the blanket away. This next little vinyasa is a combination of poses. I start on all fours, and then as I exhale, breathing out, I push back, sits bones to heels, tucking the chin in towards the chest. Inhaling, I come to all fours. Lifting up from inner arm to inner shoulder joint, Stacking the bones of the arms so that the elbows are not hyperextending. Exhale, push, exhale, breathe out, push back on its heels, chin to chest. Inhale, lift to all fours. Exhale, push, sits bones to heels. Inhale, coming to all fours. You can take that into your pranayama practice as well because it links movement with breath. It extends the rib cage to provide more space for breath. Here we go to uh, working with the bolster now. Keep in mind, your rolled up blanket, your rolled up sleeping bag, whatever you can uh, provide for yourself, is coming toward the end of the mat, like that. I'm going to use a foam chip block because they're soft. If they fall, no harm is done. And so I suggest that you find something similar 
width, let's say. It's sort of shoulder width. And a softness that should it slip out of your hands is not going to uh, bump you in an unpleasant way. We're going to come on to the back body now. And you can see how it's the shoulder blades that come on the bolster. And so the upper, the, the back neck is supported by the curve of the bolster. My head is not touching the floor. And I've got my foam chip lock at the ready. Again, we've done this before, but uh, to review, the palms are pressing the foam chip lock, the elbows are firm and not hyperextended, the feet are stepping close to the body, the heels turn out, the toes turn in. This is a starting point. Now, the foam chip lock now is simply lifted by the arms and shoulders, but this happens if I engage the muscles of the back. I get more height and I strengthen those muscles. Then, pushing into the feet, we lengthen the tailbone toward the back of the knees and firm the outer hips to lift even more and stretch the foam locks overhead and then away from us. And we keep this tremendous length as the body is firm and lengthened, the outer hips support the left. And then the tailbone dips away from the bolster and down. And now we're stretching the skin of the chest, of the abdomen, and the deep interior abdominal visceral muscles. Up we go. Again, toes turn in, heels turn out. We lift from the back body upward into the foam blocks. We press all 10 toe mounds down. Lift the outer hips up and stretch the foam blocks above the head and away. Tailbone reaches away from the bolster and down to the floor. And the muscle, skin, flesh of the chest are stretched. And then they bring the, bolt, the foam block alongside, turn entirely onto the side and come up. Next pose is going to involve the chair. In fact, I got ahead of myself. Next pose is going to involve two fold locks and a bolster. And these foam locks and the bolster are turned like this against the wall. I'm taking the belt now and making a shoulder weight loop. It's easy if you have a buckle belt to do this, but take your time if you've got some other belt arrangement to make a loop that's approximately shoulder width. In general, a shoulder width loop might be said to stretch from armpit to armpit. You can try it at this width. This belt in the posture is going to come across the elbow joints like that. We've been working a little bit today to understand the actions of shoulder joints and to keep the arm bones stacked upon each other so that the elbow joint is not hyperextended, nor is it bent. This is going to be the shape of the belt and of the hands as I show this posture. I'm taking the belt off one arm to begin with, so that I can take the posture easily. I come on to the back body, just as we did moments ago. My elbows are on the bolster, so I know the shoulder blades will slide onto the bolster. I take the hands to the top of the body and push the top of the body away, so I can lengthen the low back, and then ease myself over the bolster. Here comes the belt. The belt loop is coming across the elbow joints. As I place my hands against the wall like that, I'm stretching across the finger mounds, thumb mounds, feeling that I've got all 10 mounds on the wall evenly. I look to see if the hands are parallel on the wall, if the wrists are parallel on the wall. And I'm just stepping my hands a little further apart and stretching the fingers and thumbs away from each other. Now, I step the feet toward me, turn
turn the toes in, turn the heels up, lift the pelvis and stretch the tailbone away and feel the firmness of the hands at the wall. Maybe I can step the feet back, maybe I can lift the heels, maybe I can press the wall and lift the pelvis a little more. Firm in the outer hips. And then stretch the tailbone down and away from the bolster. Set the heels down. Let's do that again. Check to see the hands have not slipped on the wall, that they're parallel, that the fingers and thumbs are well stretched, that the whole circumference of the palm is at the wall. Turn the heels out, push into the feet, stretch the tailbone away from the wall, Firmly press your hands into the wall and now go to the outer hips and lift up and up and up and up and up a little more, a little more, a little more. And then set the hips down and bring the arms back and slip your belt off and turn onto your side and come up. That's the beginning of back bend issues, which we're going to take up in subsequent videos. But if you can get those actions going, you've got the beginning of Urdhva Dhanurasana, sometimes called the wheel in English, and it's a back bend that is so jubilant, it opens the heart and brings an exciting energy to the body-mind. Now I'm taking the bolster away, but I'm turning it lengthwise on the mat, like this. From this position, I sit sideways to the bolster because in sequencing postures, twists follow back bends. As I sit sideways to the bolster, my hip joint, the center of the hip joint, is aligned with the center of the bolster. So now the process of twisting begins. The principle of twisting is Inhale, lengthen the spine, exhale, turn. So I do. Each time the breath comes in, there's a lengthening. Each time the breath goes out, there's a turning. My intention is to take the center of the breastbone toward the center of the bolster, in that direction at least. And I don't leave out the abdomen. The abdomen has to come around, as well as the low ribs and the mid ribs. Inhale, lengthen, exhale, turn. Lengthening and turning, inching our way along the bolster, we come to this position and then turn the head to the side. This is called Bharatvajasana, a pose named for the sage Bharatvaja, and it's done in this modified way. To come out, I turn my chin to the center of the bolster, walk the hands under the shoulders, look down a bit, and inhaling, I come up. Now we turn to the second side. This time, you might want to take a look at what the feet are doing. In this pose, whether we sit or recline, the feet are cradled together like this. Because my left hip is facing the bolster, my right ankle is cradled in the arch of the left foot, like this. The feet cross one another. It's a stretch for the ankles, and it's an action that we use in a number of postures. So it's a good one to begin practicing now. Again, inhaling, I lift the spine, exhaling, I turn. Inhale, lengthen, exhale, turn. Inhale, lengthen, exhale, turn. Turning from right to left on my second side, I notice the differences side to side. Here, the top hip, and I'm pointing to it now with my hand, the top of the hip is drawing away from the bolster and down. The head is turned, and if the neck permits, you can also turn your head to the more challenging side. You can stay in this posture for three or four breaths on each side, and you can repeat it. Simply turn the video off, 
Repeat the posture and then turn the video on again and rejoin. Chin comes back to the center line. The specs come on. Hands come to the floor. We look down and we come up. Now we're going to take all of those actions, the freedom of the shoulders, the strength of the hips, the length of the trunk into this next posture. For it, we'll use the chair. But again, if the chair isn't available to you, you could use a, a low bench. You could use a little step ladder, just the, 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 the rungs of the step ladder, a coffee table. If you look around your home, you'll find lots of useful yoga props. I use the chair. I'm taking the chair now to the base of the wall because I want the chair to stay in its place. I want to be able to trust that the chair is not going to move. Some of us would benefit from taking our belt around the legs of the chair, like this, so that we've got something to hold on to because we might not be able to reach the chair legs. So a belt would be useful in this way. I'm also going to show how the belt can be used around the thighs. So I'll show that because that's not something we've seen before, whereas the belt around the chair legs, we have shown that before in previous videos. I'm turning my bolster so that it's parallel to the chair seat, as you see. Now, this bolster is sort of soft and a little bit, a little bit squishy. So I prefer to take another layer of support. And again, if phone locks aren't available to you, Instead of the foam blocks under your, uh, your, your uh, bolster, you could place a layer of, of books, for example. I often wondered if encyclopedias would ever be useful again. <laughs> I think they'd be excellent in this case. My belt is coming across the thighs now. So it's a little bit tricky to get into the pose this way. But here, here we go, the belt is coming across the thighs, but you can see that there's a space between the thighs. I haven't squeezed the thighs together. I've given a little bit of space like that. Coming into this very narrow little groove between the foam blocks and the bolster, we barely have space to wedge the pelvis in there to see that the shoulder blades are on our bolster. But let's see, let's try. Sit sideways. And swing both legs, belt it now, up onto the chair, and see, is your bolster supporting the shoulder blades? Is the back neck supported on the bolster? If that's true, you're good to go. Hold on to the chair legs, or if you're uh, holding on to the belt, hold the belt, but this time, turn the upper arms out. As I hold the chair legs, I'm turning the upper arms out. Then, step your feet to the front edge of the chair and lift the hips. And again, tuck those outer shoulders under. And holding the chair, press out into the belt with the thighs, press the heels down, and lift the outer hips up more and more. The back of the head is very lightly touching the floor. The eyes are quiet, resting into the body. The outer thighs press the belt to get more and more height on the pelvis. Throat is relaxed. Jaw is relaxed. Eyes are relaxed. Breath is relaxed. Stay. I won't stay here for eight minutes, but you could. You could stay because this crowning pose, Sajjavanda Sarvangasana, this pose will act on the nervous system to calm and quiet the nervous system and to bring so many more benefits. When you're ready to come out, release the clasp, lower the pelvis just a little, and now with a bit of luck, you'll be able to take the bolster under the pelvis we can take the extra foam blocks away, pelvis comes down, calves come onto the chair seat, 
foam blocks out of our practice space, arms released to the sides. This is a very nice way to do Shavasana. But take the belt off the thighs so you don't feel in some way bound by the belt. Let the feet coil around the sides of the chair. Let the thighs drop away from each other. Let the calves drop away from each other so that the pelvis maintains the spaciousness. Then go to the shoulder blades and slide them. See how the elbow lifts, taking that shoulder blade toward the chair? This elbow lifts, shoulder blade goes toward the chair. I like to take my specs off in Shavasana. You can set your kitchen timer or your electronic device and watch for 10 minutes and rest into Shavasana for 10 minutes. Let the whole back body relax toward the floor. Let the pelvis softly broaden on the touch of moisture. And deep in the pit of the belly, let softness come. Your whole body now in a state of deliberate relaxation. It's very different from a nap because the body and mind join in yoga to give feedback to each other as we observe the process of relaxation. In this posture, for the first time, yogis practice prachahara, withdrawing the senses. When the eyes close, the sense of looking goes inward. But where does it go? It turns toward the heart. You see the benevolence of the heart. The eyes now resting on the heart space. The sense of touch, the skin of the body, the largest organ, softens its grip on the flesh, allowing the flesh its freedom as if there were a cushion of air between the skin and the flesh and between the flesh and the bones another little cushion of air so nowhere on the body is there tension in the skin nowhere does it feel as if the flesh is overstretched on the bones the sense of taste is relaxed as the lips soften as the inner mouth relaxes, the palate softly spreads, the tongue rests in the lower jaw, long and thin and wide. The sense of hearing softly withdraws. The tiny bones of the ears relax, the eardrum is released. The sense of smell drawn inward as the nasal passages relax. We rest completely in Shavasana. Nothing to do but observe the body in this completely softened state. When the moment comes that you will release Shavasana, draw the calves onto the chair and one by one embrace the knees as a means of releasing any residual tension in the sacrum or the lower back. And then both knees come toward the chest and we could just turn a little bit side to side. Again, just resetting the spine and then turn completely onto one side and come up from there. Sit for a moment, yogis, so that you appreciate, so you experience 
this moment of quiet body, relaxed mind, and something else inside. We don't have to put words to it, yogis, but just sense what's going on in the inner self and draw your palms together and bring them directly toward the heart. When we relax the neck and the head bows, to whom are you bowing? Or to what? Or to where? I bow to you, yogis. And I bow to my friend, Dory Miller, who has made this video possible. Namaste. And thank you.